Two minutes for Ready? what? Uh, for closing. It's for I'll I'll oh. I'll, I'll keep okay. you. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> for okay. what are we doing? <laughs> All right, ready, set, and I'm going to start. All right, guys, we are rolling into the next episode of The Candace Owen Show, and I am super excited for this conversation, talking all things feminism. Um, most of you guys have figured this out. I say it all the time, but I am not a feminist, and I'm so proud of that. And there are so many elements and so many different conversations that are happening right now. I have such a good guest today to discuss them all with me. Ali Stuckey, welcome to The Candace Owen Show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, let's get the uh, elephant out of the room. Ready? Okay. You're pregnant. I am I am pregnant. Okay. <laughs> you know, it could be from all the Chick-fil-A that I've been eating too. I eat waffle fries probably four times a week. And so could be the baby, could be the carbs. Hard to tell. But I think in two months we're supposed to have a human. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's like two so, months. Wow. I yeah, didn't realize I know. you would do that soon. I know. About two months. Like two and a half months. It's and this crazy. is your first child. This is our first and it's a girl. And it's got to so. be so interesting. So we were just talking about this a little bit before we got started. But it's got to be really interesting for you having your first child. And this this abortion debate is really yeah. heating up in America at the same time. And I can only imagine because I'm so emotionally affected by everything that's going on. And I'm not totally. pregnant and I have no children. Totally. What's it like for you? Yeah. Well, I was always pregnant life. I was pro-life, of course, before I got pregnant, but it does make it more real. And that's not to say that you have to have kids in order to have a real authentic reaction to abortion and to be very passionate about it. Of course, I know so many people, you included, who are really passionate about the subject, who don't have kids yet, but when you see your child on the monitor when you're getting a sonogram for the first time and you see at just 10, 11 weeks, so still that first trimester when people are saying, uh, it's nothing, no, when you go and you get that sonogram still in that first trimester, it's got arms and legs and feet and fingers and toes. She's moving around. She's got a brain. She's got the beating heart that you can see. That's when I burst into tears. And I didn't think I would be like that, but it's this spontaneous reaction of not even realizing you have, I mean, you realize you have life inside of you, but just how human this life is until you see it for the first time and you realize that you helped create that. It's an amazing, it's an amazing feeling, but you also just realize, wow, these babies every day, thousands a day, people without even really thinking about it because they're told they're clumps of cells. They're just being discarded and, and painfully dismembered. And it does, it makes it a, a lot more real and um, also a lot more emotional. Do you judge people, and, and judge is a harsh word, but do you, do you judge people that are pro-choice? I mean, because I, I, I will say I started out pro-choice. Everybody knows my story. I started out on the left, so I can't deny. And I and I'm, I actually try to be really much more sensitive, which is yeah. not usually – that will never be an adjective that's used to describe Candace Owens. But I am a little bit sensitive uh, to people that find themselves so adamantly pro-choice because – where I think it comes from, first and foremost, the education system does a tremendous disservice to yeah. all women. When yeah. we're in school, we learn about abortion like we're choosing our shoes in the morning. Like, right. hey, would you like to wear a brown shoe or would you like to wear a black shoe? Do you yeah. want to have the baby or not? Yeah. Um, and it's very flippant. Right. And, and then they also put a, a tremendous amount of pressure on women. Like when I was in school, they would say, like, you, you're this – baby's life is going to be awful if you have it, if you don't have a two-car right. garage and a husband. Right. And then you think you're almost being responsible By if you do abortion. choose to have an abortion. Right. Right. And what I think maybe happens for a lot of people is they have an abortion at a young age yeah. because they learned it this way. And then they feel like they have to adamantly defend it because they don't want to be a hypocrite. Yeah, totally. I think what I found is that a lot of people who either had an abortion themselves or who have been passionately defending it, they don't really know what happens. And so the podcast on which I have said, okay, I'm just going to tell you guys what happens in a first trimester abortion, a second trimester abortion, and a third trimester abortion. And you guys can decide for yourselves if you think that this is something that's defensible based on someone's uh, socioeconomic status or the uh, the situation that is surrounding their conception. You guys can make that moral judgment. And most people, whether they're religious or not, whether they're liberal or not, once they really think about it, once they realize the brutality, just the physical brutality of abortion and the really the barbarism of it, they just can't bring themselves to say not only that that's okay, but why that's okay. It becomes really indefensible once you realize what you're doing to a child who is completely vulnerable. Um, what I respect is people who are willing to make that moral step or logical step who are saying, you know what, 
I thought I knew what abortion was. I, I thought it was all about autonomy. I thought it was about women's rights, uh, but I was just ignorant. And now they've learned what it is and they kind of take an about face and say, okay, I have this information. There's something I have to do about it. I can't just stay the way that I was. The people that, and I don't even want to say judge, of course, the Bible tells us uh, not to judge people as in don't condemn them in in the sense that of course we all make mistakes and have erroneous thought processes but the people who know what abortion is exactly like NARAL and uh, Planned Parenthood and even some of the Democrats in Congress who know specifically scientifically what abortion is and choose to keep women in the dark uh, choose to deceive women into thinking that this is what's best for them this is like what you said, the most responsible thing to do, I, I certainly judge their actions as wrong. And I certainly condemn their actions as wrong. I think that there's redemption for anyone. I think right. there's grace for anyone. I saw the Unplanned movie and one of the actors in the in the movie actually was a former abortion doctor. He performed thousands of abortions, but now he's moved over to the pro-life side. And I think that's an incredible testimony. That's amazing. Right. I don't look at him and say, wow, well, you know, you're still really guilty for that. I say, no, oh my gosh, you learned from that experience and you are doing so much good for this movement now. There's redemption for absolutely anyone, even someone like Cecile Richards. Right. But do I think what they're doing now is awful and completely condemn condemnable? Yes, I do. Yeah. I think I think the main ingredient that it takes for you to change your heart and your mind is humility, right? Yeah. And, and most and people don't have that. It's hard to, to look at yourself and your former self and say, I was completely wrong. Yeah. And so I had girlfriends in college that got abortion and I think about the way that first and foremost, for some of them, it deeply affected them as well. And then other ones of them made it seem like it was a joke because they learned in high school that it was a clump of cells and they yeah. would make these sort of horrible jokes. And even when I wasn't pro-life, when someone would make a joke about getting abortion, I'd be like, that, you know, that's a little too dark for me. Yeah. Right. And I think that you, you you do something like that, and it's really hard to commit and to have the humility to say, I did do this, but I am now adamantly pro-life and here's why. And I, I always want to provide a platform and a bridgeway for women to say, I did it, it was wrong, right. and I'm ready to come over to the other side. And and that is, I think, is the most important thing that we can do is, is to make people know that it is okay to change your mind on issues, especially when that issue is a human heartbeat. Yeah. The black community is, is the most negatively impacted by abortion. It is. 800 black yeah. babies are aborted every yeah. single day. Um, I talk about this all the time. I don't know where Black Lives Matter is on that. Yeah. Um, but I actually do want you to talk a little bit about what happens, uh, the abortion process in the third trimester. Yeah. Well, in the first trimester, they they make it seem like it's really easy. You just take a pill that actually poisons the child and you pass the child. That's really between anywhere from four to eight weeks when the child still almost is small enough to just kind of pass through. It's very painful for the woman. There's about cramping that happens for about 24 to 48 hours. After that, though, the child is too big to actually just pass. And so uh, you have to take out the amniotic fluid and then you have to dismiss the child to make sure that the child is fully taken out. Um, and so you dilate the mother and then you take the child out of the uterus uh, one piece by one piece and you lay it on a table and you say, okay, do we have the head, the hands, the torso, the legs? You make sure that you have everything in there, stick a vacuum up the cervix and you take the rest of the stuff out just to make sure that uh, every every bit of contents, every uh, bit of fetal matter is out of the woman. And then the third trimester, of course, is uh, really complicated because you've got a fully formed child. Third trimester, they have been able to survive outside the womb for at least seven weeks. And that child has been moving around for a long time. That child, at I'm uh, right now, I am 28 weeks. And if she were born right now, she would have a 99% chance of living outside of the womb. Uh, so really good chances. So that's third trimester. I just started my third trimester. So what you have to do is you have to induce labor. Usually there are a couple different procedures, but you induce labor, you partially birth the child, and then the doctor makes an incision in the back of the baby's skull and they take a vacuum tube type thing and they put it in the back of the baby's skull and then the brain matter is sucked out until the child's skull collapses. And that is not just, that's not hyper. Verbally, that's not an emotional argument. You can actually look up DNX abortion. It's dilation and extraction. And you're going to find that not just on a pro-life website, but you're going to find that on, you know, AmericanPregnancyAssociation.com. I, I don't know if that's the real website, but you're going to be able to find it in these mainstream organizations. That's exactly what a third trimester abortion is. And there are a couple other methods as well. But when you're dealing with a fully formed child, there's nothing that's going to be less than barbarism. There's nothing that's going to be less than murder. 
reality. And we heard the Governor Northam of Virginia actually say, okay, well, sometimes, somehow, these kids actually survive an abortion, particularly the one uh, where the abortion doctor has to cause a heart attack in uh, the unborn child in the third trimester and then deliver the child. Sometimes the child survives. And so we heard Governor Northam say, if that happens, you deliver the child, you put the child off to the side on a table or whatever, and then the mother and the doctor decide what to do. So you're talking about a child who is outside the womb, umbilical cord cut, uh, writhing, uh, fighting for his life, probably instinctually looking for his mother, wanting to be fed, wanting to be held, and you decide what to do. Now, we don't know what happened. I'm not really sure how you kill the child after that, uh, what means you go through to kill the child, but that's infanticide. I mean, that's nothing less than that. Of course, I believe all abortion is infanticide, but for those who say, no, it's not infanticide until it's outside of the womb, well, certainly third trimester abortion is nothing less than that. Right, right. I mean, it's 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 one of those arguments that it's just it's weird to me to see the left is embracing this and, yeah. and that they're they're saying that this is freedom. This is progress for right. women. Right. And how could this possibly be progress for women? And the argument that I hate the most is my body, my choice. Mm-hmm. Right. My body, my choice. Like the, the moment that you, that you get pregnant, it no longer becomes just your body. Right. right. You're sharing. You're yeah. sharing your body with your child. Right. There are two people now that are involved in this equation. So that argument and seeing these feminists and Marching and the celebration mm-hmm. in New York. What did, did Andrew call, did he light up the city of New York to celebrate the fact? Pink, yeah, pink to celebrate yeah. the fact that they could now do it nine months in the womb. I mean, you can't even you can't even really imagine that. It goes back to the feminist argument, at least the modern day feminist, at least the modern day feminist argument of saying, well, women should be able to do all the things that a man can. And so what they try to do is they try to erase any physical biological differences between men and women. Of course, we see that in this whole gender fluidity movement. That it, what does it really mean to be a man and a woman? Well, abortion really plays a part in that. Right. Um, because if a man can physically walk away from a pregnancy, then a feminist would say, well, a woman should be able to physically walk away from a pregnancy too. So rather than rejoicing in the privilege and uh, to use a leftist word, the true privilege of being able to carry a child, no matter how hard the circumstance is, because I understand circumstances are really hard for women sometimes, but instead of rejoicing in that privilege and that uniqueness of femininity, that uniqueness of being a woman, they want to take it away so they can say, eh, there's really no difference between men and women, and they think that's going to usher in this uh, egalitarian utopia where men and women don't have any differences between them and equality will be achieved. It's not going to happen. Do you consider yourself a feminist? No, I don't. Interesting. I don't. Very, very interesting. There's a lot of people that want to, and I know you said that you're not either. There's a lot of people who want to reclaim feminism. I don't really I feel see. Like let it burn. Yeah, right? just where, let where it we're die. at right now, like let it burn. I don't. Yeah. I don't really see what we're fighting for anymore. Like I get it. Like the movement had to be started because we actually did not have equality with men. We have equality with men. In most circumstances, we have more than equality with men. It's, right. it's like plus. We got. We have all of these privileges on top of it. And when I think of feminism today, I think of the Lena Dunham types. Like Lena Dunham out there. She's obviously miserable, right? And <laughs> she's not shaving her armpits, and she's and she's and she's um, going out there and saying, "This is freedom." It actually what they identify. What they what they determine to be freedom to me looks like misery, right? right? We don't need men. We don't want men. Actually, you do need men. Like actually, yeah. we cannot physically. pretend physically like biology exists. Like this is not a good platform to have abolished men. Like we don't want yeah. any more men. And the, the the movement has become so radicalized. And the only way for people to actually pull it back is to just let it burn. I'm not a feminist. I, I don't need to be a feminist. There's nothing that they're fighting for that I agree with anymore. Yeah. It seems overprivileged. It seems bratty. You have time to put on a pussy hat and go march and scream during the weekday, you probably have, you probably have achieved equality. Right. And I just want to tell Lena Dunham, like, you not shaving your armpits is not doing anything for me. (laughs) So if I'm just going to tell you woman to woman, I feel totally fought for already. Like you can go ahead and shave your armpits, girl. Right, right. It's not it's not <laughs> accomplishing that much for me. But you're absolutely right. What they're trying to do is denigrate what it actually means to be a woman because it actually says a lot about what they think about womanhood and what they think about femininity, that it is inferior to men, so we need to be more like men in order to be really equal. Well, I believe that women are unique. I believe that there are things that women can do that men can't do. I mean, beyond just carrying a child, giving birth and all of that, but 
there are things that women are better at than men. There are ways that we can lead that are better than how men can lead and vice versa. It's a very complementary relationship that we should have between the genders, of course, acknowledging equal worth of both genders. Um, but they're not willing to do that. They want to say, well, I can do all the same things that a man can. I want to be drafted like a man. And no, they never want that. <laughs> yeah. They always stop right well, there. <laughs> well, AOC, AOC the other day, she, she said, to, uh, you know, I believe that all uh, genders should be drafted. And so they think that they want all of that. No, they, they don't think want, that. want all of that until, can you picture, I mean, my gosh, AOC over there trying to defend our freedoms? No, she doesn't even. No, she's going to be handing out pamphlets at the Communist Manifesto instead <laughs> right, of doing right. what she's supposed to do. And right. people are like, I thought you were fighting for freedom. She's like, nope. And what communism. I particularly don't like about it is that the people that claim to be oppressed, and I see this in, in all different types of movements, not, not just feminism. I saw this in Black Lives Matter. The people that are pretending to be oppressed are doing the oppressing. Yeah. Right? Like they're showing up and they're saying, I'm doing this in the name of fighting against oppression when in fact you are now doing the oppression. So right. I go speak on college campuses and we have fleets right. of Antifa protesters shutting down free speech. Yeah. You're the oppressors, right? We're not yeah. out here screaming at you, telling you you can't be a liberal or that you can't speak. I can't think, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, of a single person that has showed up and a, a conservative group that showed up and said that we will refuse to let liberals speak on campus. Yeah, this absolutely exclusively not. happens to conservatives. Right. And and I find that with feminism as well is that they are actually actively now doing the oppressing. Yeah. And, and this is why I so early, and this is such a good story to bring up, um, you took a day off of, and back in June, you like took a, a social media weekend break. Oh. And all all hell broke loose on Twitter because I spoke out. I was like one of the very first people that said no thank you to the Me Too movement. I was like, this is oh. not going oh, to end yeah. up anywhere pretty, right? This yeah. is just, immediately I looked at it and I said, this is going to be really, yeah. really bad. You saw where it was going to go and that was even before the whole Kavanaugh thing. Way and I before. think that was the shift that most people saw. Okay, this Me Too movement, which I don't know if we agree on this, but I actually believe there were some benefits to the Me Too movement in that it gave women what I want to call, some people have a hard time with this phrase for some reason, but it gave women cover who previously maybe were scared to come forward and say, yeah, this happened to me. Uh, I'm not trying to press charges, but I just feel like I need to tell this story. I feel like it gave women kind of the courage to come forward and, and say that. And I think that's good. I think that maybe only bad men, not all men, but bad men should be put on edge to be like, oh, women are think, talking about this. Do you think net this. positive or net negative? Net negative because, and this is where I was going with that, with the Kavanaugh thing, we saw that it went from listen to her to believe her. And that's where justice was totally obscured. Right. So it's no longer just about listening to survivors' stories and taking courage from their stories and saying, okay, yeah, I'm going to stand up too. I'm going to say something about what happened to me too. I'm going to put those guys on notice. It became all men, toxic masculinity, especially if you're a white male in a position of power like Kavanaugh, then we're not going to believe you at all. So you just lost all logic all credibility, and I think you're right, that's probably where it was going from the very right. beginning. It's unfortunate how many casualties we've seen through it. I do think that there were some positive stories that came out of it and some good that came out of it. I wish it could have come out uh, a different way than this uh, feminist tornado that we've seen. Yeah, I'm not sure I followed any of the positive stories, and maybe that's why, because I was just so in the trenches, but what, what particularly bothered me was the conflation of terms, right? Yeah. So it's like, people don't know the difference now between rape right sexual assault yeah. and a bad date yeah. like a bad date like literally yeah. like a, like a bad date where you should be like you know what that was kind of an awkward right. dinner a weird thing at the end i'm right. going to leave and that was what was bothering me is that i actually felt bad and this is totally bizarre and i can't think of the university that the young student went to but there was there was a, a young woman who went out got completely plastered and drunk and this yeah. is the removal of personal responsibility also bothers me but we'll get into that in a second and then the next morning she woke up in the dorm of, of some young man and she said like she didn't remember what had happened and so she went to the police immediately and said that she was sexually assaulted or raped and it turns out they were able to look at all the tapes and everything happened and she was the aggressive one she mm -hmm. took him back um, and he was had over they had already dismissed him from school right and I don't, I don't know where it ended up now he could be back in school but what personally bothered me about it is I also felt bad for her yeah they're now actively teaching women yeah that everything is rape right if, yeah. you, if you don't if you have a bad memory like when I was in college and people did that stuff it was like I got 
way too drunk last night and they would reflect and they would say, I did something bad. I don't want to get, I don't want to drink to that point anymore. And they would correct their behavior. Totally. Now for women, it's, we can't do anything wrong no matter what. It's the fault of men. And I can't stand the removal of personal responsibility. And you can't talk about personal responsibility without someone calling you a victim shamer. Or a, yes, something. (laughs) Or a victim blamer. Like you must, you must hate women and you must blame all victims. And I say no, because you know what? I've been there. I had a stage in college where I was crazy and I was drinking too much. I had one semester of college. I was like the goody two shoes. And then one semester of college, I was like, I'm just going to live it up. (laughs) And it was, it was bad. I totally, I regret so much that summer or that uh, semester of college that I literally spent wasted. And I, I, and I made a lot of mistakes and my friends made a lot of mistakes in the same time, but never did it occur to me that this wasn't my fault. I was making those decisions. I made a conscious decision to say, you know what? I'm going to drink this much tonight or I'm going to do this or I'm going to go to this bar. That's not to say that the other parties involved ever with anyone are not also to blame, but to not take any responsibility, to not have any wisdom whatsoever. I think back to some of the things just, and nothing too crazy, but just some of the places that me and my friends went when we were like downtown and things like that. You're like, oh my gosh, thank God for protecting me during that stupid right. and rebellious time of my life because I it could have ended up in a million different places. It's like weeks I don't remember in college. Right. Like entire blackout weeks. And, and it's to terrible. be honest with you, like I have no idea and and it, it is terrible but terrible is good shame is good right by the way and, and, and that and the has been totally of shame lost shame is, is is what's wrong you should wake up and you should feel guilty and you should be shameful having those human emotions and owning them and right. saying i can if someone did something that makes me feel ashamed right and not running away from them it allows you to correct your behavior yeah and the left wants to remove shame yes they want you to wake up in the morning and say Oh, that little feeling. Let me take it out. Let me take it out. And and who can I now yeah. blame? Yeah. Um, who, who is around me that I can blame? And that's such a terrible system. Totally. And it's also not going to fix the issue. Yeah. Right? If you want to fix the issue, teach women how to be personally responsible. Allow them to make mistakes because they're going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Yeah. And allow them to correct their behavior. Yeah. I think that you're right. And you hit the nail on the head for something else that's happening that's even bigger than the Me Too movement. And that is this whole obsession with self-love. That we, the only important thing that we are supposed to do in our lives, we're told, not just in secular circles, this is in Christian circles too, saying all you got to do is love yourself. And if you feel shame, if you feel guilt about anything, then you just got to toss that out and remember that you're enough. And I'm like, no, shame (laughs) and guilt, not to a negative, not to like uh, a self-deprecating degree to where you actually loathe yourself, but shame and guilt over bad actions is good. Being sorry uh, for what you did and scared of certain consequences and dealing with those consequences is good. That's a part of maturity. That's a part of, like you said, personal responsibility. But we see this everywhere. We think that the reason why people are depressed, they're anxious, they're insecure, they're paranoid, which our generation really is, is because they feel too much shame. I'm like, no. It's because we don't feel enough shame for the bad things we do. And so we just fill ourselves up with things that we think will make us happy. We're told that the only important thing in life is to be happy. Well, my version of happiness when I was in college was binge drinking. So were you telling me that that's a a good thing that I should pursue? They would probably say yes, and you shouldn't feel bad about it. No, I think that guilt needs to come back into play. Right. Shame needs to come back into play. Right. And responsibility does too. Not to a negative and unhealthy degree, um, but in a way that actually encourage you to, to, to encourages you to take ownership of your actions. And if you, if you take feminism to the umpteenth degree, which I like to do when I say, okay, let's just lock ourselves into what the left has said, which is that you don't have to be personally responsible. Personally responsible. You don't have to feel any shame. It's never your fault. You don't need a man, right? You can do everything by yourself. You want to have kids. You don't need a man. You don't need a family. Let's destroy the nuclear family, right? That's the one thing they really want to see burn is the nuclear family. Yeah. Let's go find those people that actually followed that. Yeah. Do you think Chelsea Handler is happy? Does she sound happy? She just wrote a book and and she talks about how she's taking – had to take pills and and go on psychiatric medicine yeah. to cope with the election of Donald Trump. And then we've got, you know, Sarah Silverman who speaks about how she suffers through depression. And then we have Kathy Griffin. Do these people look to you like the models? Lena Dunham, do these look like the models of where you want to be in your life? And that's yeah. the question I ask myself. And yet they shame people like you, right? You're Christian. You you're you're you know you're hot on hot on the like the left loves to hate God publicly, right? They're always saying terrible things about God culturally. They mock God. They mock religion. They yeah. mock the idea of a woman marrying a man and and creating the nuclear family. Yeah. 
who would you rather be? I mean, that's really the objective question that I ask myself. Right. If you want to find fulfillment, are you going to look to these people who are famously unfulfilled? Are you famously gonna... unfulfilled? I love really? that. Yeah. Or are you going to look to the people and model your life after the people who seem to? I, I mean, no one fully has it together, but seem to have found some measure of satisfaction in their hard work, and in the family that they've created, and the things that are really outside of themselves. Because what those people tell us is that you can find all of your happiness inside of yourself just pursue the things that you want to do well the happiest times that I've been in my life the most fulfilled the sat the most satisfied the most joyful times I've had in my life have been when I'm pouring myself out for other people like getting married I mean that's such a um what we would say in the Christian community a sanctifying process of ridding yourself of yourself you are necessarily thinking about someone else which you are going to experience in a very real way really soon yeah um you are ridding yourself of yourself it's not only about your schedule it's not just what you want to eat it's not just what you want to do, what time you want to go to bed. You have someone else to think about. Right. And then motherhood, which is what I'm about to experience, brings that to a whole new level. Right, where it's no longer It's, it's not no just longer about you. Show. Yeah. But how much joy is found in pouring yourself out for other people. And that's the one of the beautiful things about Christianity is that Jesus doesn't call us to more self-love and self-obsession and self-pursuit and self-exaltation. He actually calls us to self-denial, to self-crucifixion, to take up our cross and to follow him, knowing that we we might not achieve all of the happiness that the world tells us that we should achieve in this life, but ultimate fulfillment comes in eternity. That's what we find from life in Christ. And the Christian life is not marked by one of self-obsession, but a self-denial, which is something that the rest of the world really doesn't understand. It doesn't glorify at all. And I, and I think that this is almost why what you're hitting at is, is why the left glorifies Hollywood so much, mm-hmm. because that is the ultimate version of self-love. Yeah. Hollywood, they love themselves they love more themselves. than they could ever love uh, yeah. anything else. And they really believe believe yes. that everything they say should just carry such weight. And hey, I, I'm telling you who to vote for. Right. I'm Beyonce. Right. Yeah. I'm Beyonce. Go vote for Hillary Clinton. And yeah. they can't process that there's anything outside of themselves. All they have to do is assign their name to something. Yeah. And the left wants Hollywood to be worshipped because they also want to grow government. And if you want to grow government, you have to reduce the family size. Yeah. Right. They want the government. I always say this when I when I go speak publicly, in my opinion, they want the government to replace God. Yeah. Right. Totally. They want the government to replace mom and dad. They want you to turn to the government for every single solution to all of your problems. We have a solution for that. It's no longer prayer. Like I grew up and my grandfather's deeply religious and we had to pray at every single meal. And he to me was such an example. He married my grandmother when he was 17 years old um, and they stayed together until our dying day. So he was just conservative and he was happy. You know, he lives, he lived the happiest life and he's still alive. But my grandmother passed, so they're no longer together. Um, And I see the left actively trying to destroy that because they want to replace they love atheism because that's the only way they can accomplish their goals and yeah. their goals are communism socialism and you can't do that if people believe in anything other than themselves well it's the opposite of what the founder said that okay this society that we're building this republic this democratic republic that we're building uh cannot function on an amoral irreligious society we need uh the wills and the whims of men and women to be bridled by religion and morality for a free society to work they knew that and so the opposite of that must be true as well. Uh, you can't have socialism and communism. The state cannot take over unless you have people that don't have any kind of central system or central principles or anything that they are um, that they are beholden to beyond the government. You can't have socialism without people who are godless and without people who don't have any kind of sense of central morality. That's exactly why you see someone like AOC saying, you know, we're going to provide economic security for people who are unwilling to work, not just unable, but (laughs) unwilling. So that is showing that she wants that person to be fully dedicated or uh, fully committed to, fully dependent on the government. They don't have a responsibility to God to work hard. They don't have a responsibility to family to work hard. They don't have any sense of shame. They don't have any sense of honor. They don't have any sense of obligation whatsoever. All they have is the government. I think it was the DNC a couple years ago that was their motto was the government is the only thing that everyone belongs to. And I'm like, and that's a huge problem. That's a huge problem. Problem. So you're you're absolutely right. Once you take away God and morality and really the Bible away from people's uh, 
people's uh, principles or people's set of morals that they have, then you really don't have anything. What else are they going to look for? Right. How long have you been doing your podcast? Um, a little over a year. Okay. What's what's been the hardest part for you? Because I think I just think it's very interesting to have like a Christian woman speaking out so yeah. so publicly and so unabashedly. What has been the hardest part of just being a public figure for you? Uh, I I think it has been figuring out that I truly can talk about all the things that I'm passionate about and all the things that I really do believe without worrying about polarizing one set of my audience. So you, you've you probably found this too. If you wanted to, if your only concern was to gain followers, then you know what you could say right. that people want to click on. Like you know what you could say that could go viral. You know what you could say that's going to get you a lot of clicks. But talking about the things that I'm really passionate about – I might have pushed some people away who say, you know what, I I like your politics, but I hate your religion. Or I like your religion, but I hate your politics. But to me, they're so interconnected. It is interconnected. That politics and culture are downstream from faith and values. And I'm like, how do I not talk about both of these things? Because these are the real things that are going on in my head every day when I'm watching Donald Trump or when I'm watching the news or when I'm seeing these culture wars. I'm always going back to the Bible and saying, okay, well, what does God's word say about this? So why would I isolate one part of what I believe or I'm passionate about or I'm truly thinking about throughout the day because I'm afraid that it might offend some people. And I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. I mean, you you know, you're it's the <laughs> same way. Um, and people who who whoever would ever say to me or to someone like you, the only reason you're doing this is to get followers. If the if I just wanted to get followers, trust me, the last things I, I would liberal. talk about, yeah, the last thing I would talk about is Christianity right. and the Bible and conservatism, right? Because those are really unpopular. That's what I am like. If I wanted to to just be getting followers, I would be I'd be AOC. Yeah. You know how easy that would be for me to be, be AOC so I have to know nothing. Yeah, and be you've cute got the sometimes. intersectionality points. Yeah, too, I guess from, as a black woman, woman, it would yeah. be so easy for me to get into politics as an impassioned black woman and, to hate and just call, hate Donald Trump. That's the easiest ticket in yeah. life. I'm like, are you kidding me? They they would be celebrating me everywhere. I'd, you know how many awards I would have by now? I'd have a Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. Yeah, and all I have to, be, all I have to do is say, they're white supremacists, it's on the rise, you know, and, and, and everything that's happening in America is hurting me as a black. If I wanted to be the ultimate victim, which is exactly what AOC is right yeah you would have run for office i would have run for office yeah and like this is hard especially in the black community where there's just this it's just been a block for so long it's just been a complete monolith and nobody wants to think differently i am attacked every single day yeah. i mean it never stops and, and it's difficult because i just think the black community is just we're so deeply conservative and we just had no idea. No one's turned on the lights. Like hearing you talk about, you run a podcast and you talk about the Bible and you talk about faith, you talk about religion. You should have the biggest, blackest audience in America. Yeah. Right? I'm serious. Like yeah. it should be like, they should be listening to you because that's, that is what we believe as a community. Yeah. And yet somehow it's been hijacked. But unfortunately you have even, uh, even leaders in the black community who are Christian in the evangelical community, they are also adopting a lot of the progressive doctrine, which doesn't make a lot of sense. A lot of the social justice doctrine to say, hey, whiteness is bad. Whiteness is the enemy. Uh, there was actually this this woman who spoke at a very mainstream evangelical conference in, in Dallas um, who has a, a large following and has been known to speak out about you know white supremacy and Donald Trump and, of course, conflating the two things. She gave an entire speech on why whiteness is wicked and how women need to divest from their whiteness. And this is a Christian conference speaking to Christian women. And she is not some... Whiteness is wicked. Yes. She's not some out there figure. She's got a lot of followers. And this conference, who is known for being a theologically conservative conference, invited this woman and gave her a platform. And so... Unfortunately, you're hearing messages like that. That is also infecting. I don't know specifically about the racist. black community. Could you imagine if you if you had a conference and you got up on stage and you said blackness is wicked? Yes, just uh, exactly. I love to do that. I just like to like to like play the game where I just mix everything around. Ali Saki gets up on stage and she says, "Blackness is wicked. Yes. You need to divest from being black." Well, actually, on my podcast that uh, came out as we we're recording this, that's how I started the podcast. I read her quotes from her speech using blackness instead of whiteness, and that would be racist and it is right it would be done it would be wrong for me to say that or for any white person to say that because in the in christianity in, in biblical terms blackness is not the problem whiteness is not the problem because every single race every single ethnicity uh throughout the world for all of history has been responsible for slavery for the oppression of minorities we've all been guilty of terrible things 
Um, but blackness is not the problem. Whiteness is not the problem. Sin is the problem. Right. Sin infects the human heart, and the only antidote for that is Jesus. And so for anyone who who proclaims the gospel, who says that they are the- theologically sound, to give any other solution to sin besides Jesus and his redemptive death on the cross, to say, well, yeah, but also you need to not be so white. Right. That I'm sorry, that's not it. It, it, it also is just racist. Right. And, and that's the thing that I talk about where I'm just like, people don't realize that we've gotten to a point in society where it's okay and you're allowed to be racist towards white people. That's even the stuff that AOC Crazy. tweets sometimes. I'm just like, could you imagine if she was talking about the way she speaks about white Republican men? Right. Imagine if you were just tweeting like black Democrat men once yeah. again. Like you just just won't let me be me. You you would you you couldn't. You would be skewered. Right. Your career would be over and you would never ever come back from being labeled as a racist in our society. And that's yeah. sort of what I try to get people to understand is that we're kind of getting into this dangerous spot in society where we're seeing the rebirth of racism but people thinking that because we survived it, we can now give it out, right? Like, yeah. we can just be openly racist. And racism yeah. is not okay. Yeah. I mean, you okay. have people saying, uh, for example, so you might have white people saying, you know, I'm, I'm worried for myself or I'm worried for my daughters. I'm worried for my future generations because of anti-white racism. And then you have people from the minority side saying, well, yeah, now you know how we feel. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I totally understand. And that I'm so sorry that you had to deal with that. That's not right. There were racists that maybe terrorized your family at one point, and I'm so sorry for that. But the remedy to that is not retribution. Right. The remedy for that is forgiveness and redemption, what it always is. And not even saying forgiveness because, for example, they want uh, you know the government to pay reparations. Well, I don't <laughs> need to be forgiven for slavery. I mean, that happened 150 right, years right. ago. That's I'm not insane. responsible for that. That's ins- and so, so insane. But that's what social justice is. It's all these crazy calculations of how the oppressed is going to be taken care of and it just never works out in the end. Where where is it heading? Where is it heading on the left? I want you to make a prediction for like the next 2 years. Like where where is this all going? This the, the radicalization, the the Alexandria ocasio Cortezes. Yeah. Um uh, who's the other young woman in Congress? I always, Ilhan Omar. Well, Ilhan Omar Rashida and then Rashida Tlaib. Tlaib. Yeah, Rashida yeah. Tlaib. Where is this heading? I think that they're pushing intersectionality so far that it can go one of two places. They're taking us to the extreme on abortion, on socialism, on racial reparations, on abolishing private prisons, on um, taking us to open borders, that either we're going to settle for a moderate leftist position and say, okay, so they're taking us to the extremes, but okay, we're not going to go for Medicare for all, but we'll go for health care for all. Okay, we're not for open borders, but we're for abolishing ICE. That will kind of compromise, that uh, there will be some kind of compromise, I'm Unfortunately, by enough people on the right to be like, okay, you wanted to take us to these extremes, we'll settle for the moderate democratic position, or there's going to be a swing all the way over to this side saying, hang on for a second, can we just talk about the consequences of intersectionality? Like, can we talk about the consequences of the injustices of social justice? Let's look at the consequences of open borders. Let's look at the look at the consequences of uh, gun control. And we could swing back in the other direction, but. It, it's just hard, to, and I'm not hopeless, but it's hard to see that happening without, like we said, there being a beckoning back to morality and a beckoning back to principles, a beckoning back to the traditional family. It, it's just really difficult to see how people are just going to stop depending on the government if they don't depend on anyone in their community. Right. I mean, I don't know. I'm much more optimistic. Like, I, I, oh, tell me. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I want to be optimistic. optimistic. So I just, I just look at the trends, and I think that, and, and my fiance always says this. He's just like, what we're seeing now on the left is like the last squeals of a dying animal yeah. because they're just so radical now that it's like, what is That's that even that happening? Be right? true. Yeah. And and when I see people like you who you know, your profile has has exploded over the last couple of years and I came out of nowhere and now we're seeing this black movement that's happening, which they never saw coming. We're seeing this Hispanic movement happening. Yeah. We're seeing Jexodus, right? People now that people are yeah. Jewish people are talking about it. And I just observe it on These the ground. Are just I know so Lexa, clever. Jexodus, like, yeah. Um and I think that that means that movement is there's happening. a reaction there's a reaction and I, yeah. I, I i think morality is at its core where it's just that i actually can no longer drive with this and to me it's not even just a reaction it's an awakening yeah right like i genuinely look at the way that i was and i think that i was just asleep like i just had i, I didn't know. care yeah i didn't care about politics i had never voted so it's so yeah. funny people say to me like oh now you're a conservative i was i was nothing i just i yeah. was in a bubble i didn't really care about it i was happy to let somebody author my entire future but once you have that awakening and you realize how you've been used how you've been abused and just how crazy the left has become yeah. you want to become you want to become a part of it and yeah. i think that america is somehow like the last stand yeah. and oh totally brexit we've got we've got we've got uh, bolsonaro in brazil we've got brexit happening over in the uk and we have Trump. 
Yeah. There's something happening. Yeah, I agree with you. I do think that the left probably thought that they were going to take this home. You know, with Hillary Clinton, there's no way that Donald Trump is going to win. We're just going to go this direction. I mean, Obama completely moved our country to the left so radically, more radically than we had seen in a really long time. You could argue maybe that was even a reaction from from George W. Bush. Who knows? But he moved our country so far to the left. We disagree more than ever on things like race, on things like homosexuality, things like marriage, things like welfare, immigration. And that really happened from about 2009 to 2017, where we mostly agreed on things before we disagree more than ever. And they call him the great reconciler and the person who brought people together. No, he completely split us apart with identity politics. And so we are seeing a reaction. And I think that's a very hopeful perspective. And I hope that it's right. People are saying, okay, hang on for a second. All these things that made America great for so long, we're just going to throw them out the window right. to Get look more like statues. Venezuela. Right. I don't know. Yeah, it's really bizarre, um, and it's um, obviously we're going to find out, right? We're in the midst of it, but I'd like to think that you and I are doing our part in opening the yeah. conversation and just yeah. getting women to think just a little bit harder about where we're at That's and where what it everything is. is going. It's thinking a little bit harder. Yeah, just think a little bit harder. So we wrap up every episode with a two minute game. Oh, <laughs> oh. Just a two minute okay. game. Fun. Okay, where well, we I just say games. you have exactly two minutes and you get to launch a vibration into the world. And let's say that everything that it's going to be heard by everyone all over the world and it just has to become a thing. What is your advice? Wait, what? You just, you're just going to speak for two minutes into that camera and you are going to say just what you would say to the world. Hi, I am Allie and this is what I believe. What is your advice? Okay. Hi, I'm Allie. Oh, wait, do I start? On your mark, get set, go. Hi, I'm Allie and Candace told me to tell you what I believe. So I think the most important thing that you can believe in your life is not that your purpose in this world is to pursue your own happiness or to pursue the things that you want, um, but to know your creator and the son that he sent uh, for you to die on the cross for your sins, to be reconciled to a perfect and holy God. We're an imperfect and an unholy people and we needed someone to bridge the gap and Jesus did that for us. I don't think that there is any greater satisfaction than knowing the one that died for you. And it's not just a salvation and the life after this. It's also sanctification and purpose uh, on this life. That is the gospel. That is the best news that history has ever given us. It's going to be better than any book that you'll ever read is uh, the story of Jesus Christ and what he did for sinners. And that's really the most important thing that I could tell you beyond any conservative policy, beyond anything I could say about AOC or feminism. Uh, That's the gospel. That's the good news. And that's the only message you really need to hear. That was perfect. Oh my God. Did she get (gasps) direct? Oh my God, that was amazing. Oh. That was amazing. Thanks. Thank you so much. That's a wrap. Thanks. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, thank you so much for being flexible. I know it was so crazy. Oh. Thank you guys for watching the latest episode of The Candace Owens Show. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As many of you guys already know, PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means we need your help to keep all of our content free to the public. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation today. I would really appreciate your support.